welcome back to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. Well, Nina, how are you? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks for asking, Kyle. Uh, I am recovering from COVID. I got the big ro-ro a few days ago. Actually, the start of February, I tested positive for COVID. And I am now in the process of recovering. I sadly um, did not recover fast. But I luckily did not have the worst of the worst symptoms. So thank you for asking, Kyle. And for those in the audience, yes, I was missing for a while because I got sick. Yeah, so that's the reason why we weren't able to record and post an episode last week. It's because of that. Uh, so I, first of all, I don't want anyone to think that I just generally just don't um, <laughs> check up on Nina. I, I do. It's just, you know, I haven't done it today. It was Nina's choice to bring up COVID. I was just genuinely curious as to wow. how. You know. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, for today's episode, you wanted to talk about historical reparations. Uh, but we recognize that we're not the best people to talk about some of these things, particularly Black History Month. But you wanted to bring it up a little bit about recognizing our limited capacities to really talk about the subject. So yeah, it is Black History Month. You will probably see and hear a lot of Western media talk about Black history for the month of February. And that's because, well, it's a more positive thing. It's not just about like, oh, racism was bad, racism, racism was bad, um, slavery was bad. Just everyone already knows about that. I mean, um, that's not true, though. That's not true. A lot of people still argue for slavery and things like that. But for the most part, I hope the most uh, majority of the world thinks that those things are bad. But, yeah, you know that's true. That's true. But Black History Month, if I'm not mistaken, is geared towards a more positive focus. Like let's because like if we're just talking about slavery, you know, it's we're talking about slave owners because like unfortunately a lot of our records of who these slaves were is lost to history. Like we don't know their names anymore or who they were and stuff like that. But we do know that uh, at least from the period we do know like the bad things that white slave owners did so for black history month there's a significant amount of effort to move away from discussions about white people and start talking about the actual contributions that were given by black people so black history month is less about how um they were victimized uh, and actually, a lot of Black people say that we shouldn't see ourselves as victims. But let's talk about instead, you know, our achievements over the past 400 years. Because for the past 400 years, that's almost half of a millennium already, Black people have been contributing to the development of the United States. But their contributions have been minimized by most white historians. And my personal favorite example is the fact that most of the infrastructure in Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the United States, was actually built by slaves. Yeah, so the White House, for example, you can call it the White House because it was built by Black people for white people. Uh, so apparently, and this is from whitehousehistory.org, um, nobody wanted to work on the building. So they had the Congress had appointed um, commissioners to, you know, organize the construction of the White House. But the White House um, was having some problems being constructed because no one wanted to work on it. Uh, they initially planned to get Europeans to work on it, but no one wanted to do it. So that's when they got slaves to do it. It helped that Washington, D.C. was stuck between Virginia and Maryland which were both slave states at the time. Um, so it's like a huge amount of irony um, on one end that you saw a Black family moving into the White House uh, with the Obamas. But also, and this is the perspective that Michelle Obama um, wanted to have on it, uh, they said that their presence in the White House is more of a statement of the constant struggle of the Black community and their constant achievements that led to them being there. Um, so it wasn't really focusing on the negative aspect. It was focusing on like a more positive kind of thing. Um, another example for this is the U.S. Capitol building where the legislature is, like the Congress is in. Um, so there's a wing for the House of Representatives. There's a wing for the Senate. 
the Capitol building was where Democrats were arguing against giving Black people any rights in the 1860s when they were debating about the 14th Amendment. So you can probably watch movies like Lincoln and you know you can see that the, that was the Capitol building. That's where they were talking about like giving Black people the right to vote is not something that you want because how can we recognize in law that you know, black people are just as human as white people when God made them less than human. So those kinds of lines are being brought out in um, in the Capitol building. And in present day, modern Republican senators are trying to disenfranchise black voters by blocking the expansion of voter registration laws, um, by imposing more restrictions on who can vote. Um, and it was also, you can if you can remember, the U.S. Capitol was attacked by right-wing terrorists last year, and many of those people who stormed the Capitol were white nationalists that were trying to defend Trump. Um, so unfortunately, again, because of history and stuff, we don't know anymore who directly built um, these infrastructure projects. In The Invisibles, which is a book by Jesse Holland, they were arguing that it's not even possible to find out anymore who these builders were because they never even bothered to record the names of the crew who worked on it. Because why would you? Like at the time, they weren't considering these people as humans. So there wasn't any reason to list down the names and identities of the slaves that they got to work on, uh, to work on the White House and the Capitol and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it's no secret the world we inhabit today is full of these inequalities, full of these really tragic stories. But as the Black community is trying to thrive, right, and doing their best to move away from those negative narratives, we have themes, actually, per month um, or per year, I guess, for each Black History Month. This year, the theme is health and wellness. So it focuses more on not just mental health, but physical health and the the struggles that the Black community goes through in the medical field, not just as people who are being treated, but people trying to be individuals who treat different diseases and the struggles that they face because of discrimination. I think one of the most famous cases would be like the Hella cells. Um, So if you don't know about that, basically a lot of the stem cell research that's going on right now regarding cancer cells was because they took, um, what's her name again? Harrietta? Henrietta Lacks. Uh, Yeah, Henrietta Lacks. Um, They got one of her... I don't know where the cells were located, but they stole her cells, are using it to develop research. And up until now, there is no payment being made to the family. They are benefiting from basically the the abuse that they did to her body, right? Like some people would say I'm overreacting when I say it's abuse, but it's abuse because consent was not given when they took those cells, right? So this month focuses on the health struggles of the Black community, And again, as Kyle mentioned earlier, we don't have the most ascendancy to talk about these things, but we do have the platform. And we think that in our limited capacity, we do have the obligation to talk about these issues and, you know, encourage our audience to read up more about these topics, to go to different Black content creators and give them the spotlight that they need, read up on these stories, read up on different books. I have a few suggestions, actually. If you want to learn about mental health and the Black community, there's this book I read recently called I'm Telling the Truth, But I'm Lying. Um, It's a really good book. It's a memoir about a Nigerian-American immigrant who is also someone who suffers from bipolar 2 disorder. So very close to my heart. Um, Obviously, there are some parts I can't relate to, like the struggles of diagnoses, because like the Black community faces a lot of discrimination in that aspect. But Still very informative. I really recommend it. Um, Another book I would recommend is Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. Angela Davis is a known activist for the Black community. And this book is basically a call for international solidarity amongst different oppressed groups like the Black community and Palestinians. The Palestine-Israel conflict, I'm not going to touch that Pandora's box right now, but... it does link a lot with the struggles of the Black community more than you would think, right? And it's interesting to find out about how those things happen through this book. And obviously, everyone's uh, classical recommendation to Kill a Mockingbird, it's a classic for a reason. I really recommend you read up on it. 
or watch the movie if you're not the reading type. But basically, um, I want you all to use this month to like give yourself more knowledge about the Black community. And for this episode in particular, I know that was a really long intro. Actually, it's more like a mixed discussion already at this point. Cal and I have a lot of thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> basically, what we want to talk about in the debate sense, right, is the idea of reparations. Because I think a lot of what Kyle said, uh, you can't contest it, right? Like, obviously, slavery, bad. Um, like, lack of consent, bad. Um, abusing the Black community, bad. But it's a question of what we do now and what we can do as the current generation that has to sort of know about these things and live with the, if you're white, you live with the benefits that your ancestors got by enslaving someone. Or if you're a person of color, you have to live with the consequences that, you know, like your past has brought upon you because a lot of these problems are intergenerational, um, which we'll be discussing more thoroughly as we go on through this episode. But the idea of reparations is basically like giving someone what they are owed. And it sounds very simple in its logic. Um, I think it should be simple. I just don't think it's as straightforward as a lot of people think it is which is why we want to talk about it but just know while we are talking about black history month and the black community um reparations is not unique to them our examples however will be about them but just know that we have a lot of reparations in status quo already for different things because our law basically encourages it and makes it a thing right kyle yeah, it's not it's not just a thing. It's like it's a huge part of law already that like in the United States you have a lot of these claims against other people for like wrongful action, wrongful death, etc. um torts and stuff. Here in the Philippines we call it damages. Um because like we obviously don't live in a vacuum as individuals. Like everything we do directly affects another person and while we can't like go back in time and make make it so that these things never happened. We tried to compensate them in in monetary um, forms. So like let's give them financial compensation for the harm that they they incurred. But also there is something called symbolic reparation. So you can see it in Black History Month. So that is a form of symbolic um, reparation because like again we don't know who built the White House anymore. Like. We forget who they are. So the best that we can do is to give some sort of symbolic reparation that recognizes their contributions, even though their names might have been lost to history. So that's one kind of reparation that we have. And even here in the Philippines, um, we did have human rights uh, violations victims during the martial law era. Um, So when we're talking about reparations to those victims, we're not just going like, let's give them money, let's give their families money. But it's also like recognizing that historical wrongs have been committed and sort of educating people on those wrongs. And that takes the form of symbolic reparation, which is why um, a few years ago, when the dictator was buried in um, the Libingan ng mga bayani, um, everyone was mad and there was a dissent from former Chief Justice Melu Serrano, Sereno and um, current Justice um, Leonin. They were talking about symbolic justice, uh, symbolic justice, symbolic reparation, and how if we put this dictator in this cemetery, um, we sort of spit in the faces of the people that they victimized. Um, Name drop mo na, shut up. <laughs> uh, si, ano, yung mga Marcos. <laughs> but, but okay, the reason why he was allowed to stay there was because even though we call it libingan ng mga bayani, it's not really there because like hero sila. Okay, bayani yung, the term is bayani, which we can um, translate into into hero. But in law, it's actually reserved for people in the military, including presidents. So unless they were disqualified um, because of like dishonorable discharge or conviction of a crime or something, or they were impeached, then they they are not allowed to to be buried there. But since um, Ferdinand Marcos was not apparently dishonorably discharged um, from the military, 
even like even considering Edsa, right? You can say, and actually Carpio, just as Carpio was saying that that was dishonorable discharge as the commander in chief of the military when he was removed uh, through a revolution. Still, the Supreme Court was like, yeah, no, he, he qualifies. Since he qualifies, um, the president has the power to just determine who who gets to stay there. So yeah, it's I mean, that's why that's why it's symbolic, right? That's why the main argument is about the symbolic aspect of it. Because if you're talking about like the technical parts, like they deserve to be there. But you know, anyway, back to Black History Month. <laughs> Sorry for yeah. the tangent. No, but like, um, it's not just about those big things like Black History Month or or martial law. It it also really applies to everyday occurrences. Like the the rule is if you commit a wrong and that wrong causes damage or injury to another person, you have to compensate that other person. So this isn't legal advice, but like. Let's say you own a business, right? Let's say, for example, you make bags. And in order to make bags, you need to have a supplier of leather. Um, so let's say you, you took a bunch of orders for bags. They paid you already, um, but your leather supplier ghosts you. Like it just stopped replying to you, um, even though you already paid for this month's shipment of leather. So as a result, you couldn't make the bags. Um, people want refunds, people cancel their orders, people say you're not a reliable seller, you get really bad reviews on Facebook Marketplace, those kinds of things. So in that case, the supplier needs to compensate you, um, the business owner, because as a result of their ghosting, you lost money because you didn't get what you paid for. You also lost profits because people asked for refunds, they canceled your orders, um, your reputation also suffered which might mean that you have less opportunities to sell in the future, or it might have cost you um, mental anguish and stuff like that. So the supplier needs to compensate you in the form of damages. So there are many different kinds of damages, like there's actual damages, compensatory damages, moral damages, stuff like that. And like all of these things, you can talk about them for a while, but that's a general rule, right? Now, if like they directly harmed you, you need to be paid. You need to be paid. You need Has to be that ever happened to you? Like, have you ever been in a situation where you had to be compensated or given reparations? I mean, no, because usually, right, um, if you're a very young person, you don't really enter into these very formal contracts with strangers. Yeah. So usually in, in order to enforce this, you ask, oh, could you give me, could you compensate me for this? And usually they do um, because we're, we're both just small time. But like if, we're talking about like big people, like actual corporations and stuff. There is a chance that you will have to go to court to enforce this obligation. Um, so th- this uh, this whole field of law that's just dedicated to that. But whenever you think about a time when you feel like a wrong was committed against you and you feel like you had to spend money because of that, I think that you can probably tell yourself that maybe there's a case here. Maybe I should contact a lawyer if you really feel that that way about it um so i can't i can't tell Again, you this to, is not, uh, legal, advice. not legal advice right? <laughs> um, but i was thinking about like what if because of like an abusive partner or something and you had to get therapy because of how badly you were treated like can you sue um your abusive ex-partner for the costs of the, the therapy that you needed to get because therapy is very expensive no and i I even mentioned in a status recently that I had to get some help from a child psychologist, um, partly because I was, you know, just a little dickhead, but, but also because <laughs> like some of my teachers are like, yeah, let's let's isolate this person. It actually damaged a big big part of my psyche. So um, I was thinking like, should I should I get a lawyer? <laughs> should I get a lawyer? I think um, you probably should. Like, why not? You know, like, sue. I mean, let's be very American. and Just sue everyone, sue everything. Try to get some money out of the situations you got. Anyway, given all those things about reparations, and now that we see that it's something that takes place in everyday life, whether you're in a corporate field of life or if it's about your personal life or mental health, even with Kyle's example about abusive relationships, there can be arguments made about historical wrongs and why reparations should be there. And for this episode, we want to run you through exactly how to make these arguments, whether you're making them for yourself or making them for other people. And typically, there are three steps to doing this. The first step is to point out that a historical wrong has taken place. 
um, the second thing you do is point out that even if there is a wrong, there is an ongoing harm that is still affecting you. And the third step is to talk about the reparative action or what you want in return that is commensurate or equal to the damages that have been caused on you. And I guess I'm going to take it from here. Step one, right, is about pointing out the historical wrong. So injustices have been happening against entire groups of people for as long as, you know, time and memorial, for as long as society has had the ability to go to different countries <laughs> and basically enslave different civilizations. Um, so for the Black community, there's slavery, colonialism, land grabbing, even segregation, like Jim Crow laws. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed about this, Kyle, because I've only recently learned about Jim Crow lo- laws. Like, I know segregation was a thing, but I didn't know how bad it was. Like, in high school, were you taught these things? No, we didn't yeah. have any of that, actually. Like, yeah, we didn't either. <laughs> um, Our education in history was really, really bad. Like, we did have this concept of, like, Western history, Eastern history, but we never really brought it to the modern day. Like, the Western history education I mean, was about, like, Shakespeare and um, oh, Henry VIII and stuff like that. But, yeah. like, we never go into, like, let's talk about slavery. Like, if it's an uncomfortable topic, we just skip over it. Like, um, slavery, let's skip over that. Martial law, let's skip over that. Um, so I, I, this is not a unique experience to me in San Beda, but, like, I remember... Um, I was talking to some of my friends about that, uh, how we were taught uh, martial law. Um, yung sakin, it was just like, oh, we were we were not disciplined and stuff like that. So it's like martial law um, apologia. So they, they go like, yeah, hu- human rights abuses. But ang kulit kasi ng mga bata noon eh. Like <laughs> oh my God, that's horrible. I mean, yeah. we didn't talk so much about oppression in the West. But we did talk a lot about martial law. But I'm from state school, so we're like an anomaly there. But I think yeah. it's a it's a common experience for Filipino schools that we don't talk about Western struggles so much, which you know can be a pro or con, right? If you're because it's a good thing that we're not focusing so much on our colonizer and focusing more on ourselves. At least that's the case for state school where we talked more about our own history. Yeah. We weren't focusing on anything. We were just like, <laughs> yeah, let's skip this. It's uncomfortable. Let's just list down things that they did, things that were sort of controversial, I guess. Let's move on. I was just like, what, what do these controversies mean? So another one of my friends, different school naman, um, it was like a table of pros and cons for martial law. But then it wasn't giving you like the answer, right? What? Because it was like, you saw that there was like a list of infrastructure Why would you projects write pros? On, on the left hand side. On the left hand side, you're like infrastructure projects of Marcos. So it's like a long list, right? And then on the right-hand side, it was just like one or two lines of, yeah, human rights abuses moving on. So like visually, it seems like Marcos has done more good than harm. And I feel like a lot of people took that from it. Like, yeah, we, yeah they, they stole some money. They committed human rights. Um, they committed human rights violations. But see, we have, we have the long center. We have the film center and stuff. Yeah, but I don't want to take away from like the discussion of Black History Month because I think we talk a little bit <laughs> too much about martial law. Um, but we, you know, I mean, it's election season, very important. But yeah, so I brought that up because I realized like I didn't get a lot of education about Black history, um, which, you know, I think I think we should, right? Um, I think that's debatable though. Do you think like Filipinos should learn about the struggles of other communities? when we don't even have the capacity to learn about our own struggles sometimes? I think that we should. I think that we should learn from as many sources as we can. Right? So that will definitely include Black history. It should. Because like a lot of these revolutions, you can learn from each other's revolutions. And actually, we can use the context from these other places and use it to inform us of our own situation. And that happens a lot. Like, Yesterday, I found out that Sun Yat-sen, who is the father of Taiwan, um, he was actually inspired by Rizal's works. So I, I, I didn't know that. Like Apparently, Jose Rizal is Mr. Worldwide. He did inspire a lot of these um, different world leaders. Um, 
like um the Ed's revolution was studied by a lot of other people as well um from different countries and it inspired them to make their own peaceful revolutions um the philippine revolution um against spain was partly a result of people going to the west and learning about the french revolution and it made them realize that we should yeah we're we're, we're pretty messed up in in the homeland let's do a revolution or let's fight against um our our oppression right so I think that it's very important for us to understand um, Black history as well in the Philippines. So that it might include like Jim Crow laws. It might include like um, education about the 13th Amendment, um, racial segregation, that those kinds of things. And it's not just for, I know, for Black history. Like we can also talk about Cambodia and stuff. Like in, in second year high school, we talked about Asian history. Maybe that's where we can talk about Um, the situation in Cambodia, right? So I feel mm. like this is a completely different topic from from historical reparations. But I think that even though in those countries they probably have a duty to make symbolic reparations and financial reparations, in other countries there is also a benefit to learning about those historical wrongs committed in other places. Yeah, so that brings us back to step one, right? The historical wrongs and pointing them out just so you can have a clearer picture of what oppressions people are going through because it might not be happening anymore. Like slavery might not be as widespread as it used to be. Jim Crow laws stopped in 1968. But for 100 years, right, from the post-Civil War era around 1865 to 1968, like they were marginalized individuals just because of the color of their skin. And up until now, obviously, that 100-year advantage that the white people had, it still plays a role to what's happening today, like the amount of housing that goes to the Black community or the opportunities that they're given. Even like the amount of money that they're able to earn in their entire lifetime has been dictated because the whites had a 100-year like head start over them. Besides Jim Crow laws, you can also see different massacres that have happened before. Like the famous one is the Tulsa Massacre. Uh, what does that movie, I don't know if you watched this together, Kyle, but there's a movie that depicted the Tulsa Massacre. It wasn't a movie. Uh, first of all, yes, you watched it together. Second, it wasn't a movie. It was the Watchmen series. Ah, I think the, yeah, the yeah. first episode was the, the Tulsa Massacre. Yeah, yeah. But like that 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 show, right? It it showed it wasn't really about racism. Oh, actually it is. It's like it a metaphor. Was like yeah, super. it is literally a metaphor for racism. But it, it's not it's like it's not very in your face about it if you're not like tuned in for it. But if you're a debater and you have like a, a knack to spotting metaphors, and I, I really think The Watchmen is also a really good series to watch. Um, it's obviously like very debatable as well, like a lot of the philosophies there. <laughs> But it's it's I think it's a fun thing to watch also if you just want to like see racism and how it plays a role, whether in the past or in the present. I actually disagree with you. I because uh, on the point that it was kind of subtle, I think it wasn't super subtle. Like in no, the first I mean, part, like, I'm I'm talking to about like the dumb Americans, you know, like the dumb people who will really reject any political implications that a show has. Like, some people argue like, oh, don't make the Watchmen political. It was never political. It's just a bunch of superheroes. So obviously they're wrong, right? I'm just... Yeah, super wrong. Yeah, they're super wrong. But I, I don't agree that it is subtle. I'm saying that it's subtle if you are not tuned in for it at all. <laughs> like, Yeah, but that, was a, that, uh, that series was quite amusing for me because like, They're so cheeky about it sometimes. Like, um, they don't say, "Ha, huh, this is a joke about how racism is damaging," <laughs> but they they go like, um, in in the first episode, like there was there was someone who was teaching how to make like omelets, and at the, the, one of the first things that they go like, "So you have to separate the the whites from the yolks." I was like, "What? <laughs> What did you say?" Yeah, like um, for a lot of people, that's gonna fly over their heads, right? So yeah, yeah I'm just saying. But there are other parts that are just, it's impossible for it to flow to fly over your head. Like one of the characters um, hides a, a KKK costume, a hood in their, in their closet, right? But anyway, yeah, 
Yeah, that's um, so, I don't want to spoil. I don't want to spoil it. I really just think people should watch it. Like, if you're not into the classics, then watch modern, like modern media about the blacks, black lives struggles. I think, I think, like people have been really creative these past few years, and these shows, as much as they are uncomfortable, they're also very entertaining. Um, which you know is also debatable. Oh um, like, man, Black Clansman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, did we watch that together, Black Clansman? I, I think we did, or we watched it separately, but I do remember watching it. Yeah, so Black Clansman is this hilarious... I'm not mansplaining to you something that we watched already. This is for, for the audience. I, I need to make that distinction sometimes. Black Clansman, for people who haven't watched it, it's this um, sort of dark comedy movie um, about a, about a real-life story where a Black guy... Um, who was in the police infiltrated the KKK by pretending to be a white supremacist as well. It was mostly really on the fun. phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mostly on the phone. I mean, for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think like I think Obama put it in his top X number of movies for that year. Um, that's how. Maybe like, that's why we watched it. I feel like we we had a. I remember binging some of Obama's recommendations. I think like we did some together. Yeah, every year Obama gives like recommendations for like music movies and stuff like that and i was like that's cute that's cute um, <laughs> anyway um, anyway so that's the first step right that's the first step hmm. um talk about the historical wrong um the second step is as you mentioned try to discuss how th- the harms that were caused by the historical wrong cascades into the present day um so this is actually something that you can see in in our current laws um because like like we mentioned earlier, um, sometimes wrongful actions don't exist in a vacuum. They they turn into something else. They sort of metastasize and affect other aspects of your life. So, um, for example, let's say that you were a factory worker or a seaman, and then you get into a car accident. And because of that car accident, you become paralyzed. Um, and so you can't work in your job as a manual laborer anymore. So the person who caused the accident has to pay you for the immediate harm, which is the medical cost, right? But they also have to pay you for the consequential damages or the consequential harms, which happen as a consequence of that wrongful act. So it would be something like lost income or, um, you know, um, because your action made someone lose their job. So that's sort of a principle comparison or like an intuition pump for historical reparations. You can't just pay for the immediate stuff, right? So you can't just be satisfied with giving you know, like a, a former slave some money, especially since they're dead already, right? A lot of them, most of them have already died, so we can't really directly pay them. But the consequences exist even today. Um, so slavery was bad in and of itself, but millions were deprived of land that, and That continued throughout generations. Capturing and torturing human rights defenders is already harmful, but it also means years where their children couldn't grow up without their parents, right? So um, why do, and uh, since you were talking about Jim Crow laws earlier, why do ghettos have a lot of Black people? It's because historically, places where people lived were demolished to make way for government construction projects. And Black people, since they were statistically poorer because slavery prevented their great-grandparents from amassing and passing down wealth, and also probably because racists didn't want to employ them, um, they weren't able to afford um, fancy new housing, right? So while white people um, were also evicted, they had the resources to buy new housing in fancy areas. Black people had no choice but to gather together in enclaves known as ghettos now. So... Look, um, if you think about Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro will insist that there's no such thing as systemic racism today because oh. slavery is illegal. Because, look, it's illegal to be racist, so the laws aren't racist. And therefore, there's no such thing as systemic racism. Ew, why did you have to do it in their voice? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, yeah, um, Ben Shapiro insists that there's no such thing as systemic racism because ostensibly, right, at first glance, laws aren't racist. But racial inequalities um, are a result of racist systems anyway. Like, so it's absolutely untrue what Ben is saying because um, private activity, because what he's arguing is racial inequalities are a result of racist people, um, private individuals, 
not like government actions or or laws, right? But those private acts of racism in a lot of cases could not have happened and it could not have succeeded in segregating people on racial lines unless there were also governmental policies that were designed to ensure that segregation. So um, I really appreciate my law education because um, when we were talking about the Bill of Rights in first year, um, we were recommended a chapter from a book by Rothstein called The Color of Law. It's a very recent book. It's from 2017. Um, and Rothstein was arguing um, about how government policies, even those that were ostensibly neutral on the matter of race, served to further racial inequality. And that includes the, the stuff about ghettos. So there's no law saying that the police, for example, should over-police Black neighborhoods. But because of social conditions like poverty, government abandonment, um, that push many young people um, young Black people to crime, they do end up getting over-policed. Um, here in the Philippines, Taman, for example, human rights violations happened in the past. Money was stolen by the government in the past. We're still paying for that today, right? Like they need to pay for a huge amount of debt that was incurred by the Marcoses, um, specifically for the Marcos. But, you know, let's not, let's not isolate things because they were all basically complicit in that. Because they, we were basically paying for, you know, Imelda's shoes, for example. Um, and we're still paying for it today. How do you pay back a debt? If you're the government, it is by increasing taxes so that you can gain more revenue to pay off that debt, right? So we are still literally paying for it today. We're still suffering the consequences of that today. So if you don't have justice in those cases, you can't move on. So for Black Lives Matter, their slogan is no justice, no peace. Um, the other day, um, Lenny was on record saying that we cannot unify unless you first address past wrongs. Um, no justice, no peace. We say no justice, no unity. Um, and that's something that I feel like you really need to do as a debater. You will need to explain why the harm is ongoing. You need to spend time in it because I think this is what's considered a hard sell for many people, right? Like the past is in the past now, right? They would mm. say that. So your job is to say that the present is built on the past. Um, you don't, I don't think you have to be very absolutist about it. So you don't necessarily have to say that everything is dictated by that, but you can say that a huge part of it is affected by um, things that happened in the past. Yeah, you know how a lot of people would say that you know, they're not against reparations. They're just against like the amount that we're giving because it seems overkill. I think those people are blind to like the cascading effect that ass wrongs have to what's going on today. Like everything's a butterfly effect, right? Like if you're into those conspiracy theories, especially if you're like a white supremacist and you're into conspiracy theories, it's really strange to me that you can be into conspiracy theories but not agree with the sentiment that what happened a hundred years ago still affects someone today, right? It makes like I, uh, I don't know how people can have that kind of dissonance with their logic. But anyway, so that's step two. Kyle explained wonderfully that you need to point out that harms are still ongoing. I guess the last step for me is the hardest one, right? It's talking about the reparative action itself, because. Most times, a lot of people will agree that a wrong was done, right? And you need to make up for it. They'll just disagree on how much do we give back? In what form do we give back, right? When do we know if it's proportionate? When do we know when it's commensurate? And where do we go from here? Those are usually the common questions. So I've done some research, and there are usually just five things that the Black community asks for, right? In terms of really getting um, reparations in the form that they want to equalize the playing field. Of course, it's not going to solve everything, but it will elevate their status a little bit and give them a fighting chance against systemic problems, systemic racism, white supremacy, etc. The first one is obviously the very basic understanding of reparations, which is individual payments for descendants of enslaved Black Americans. So the U.S. government owes a lot of wages as well as damages to the people it helped enslave and the people it enslaved itself in building its own infrastructure, as Kyle mentioned. And according to the Federal Reserve, um, especially back in 2016, white family 
get an average family wealth of $171,000 compared to Black and Hispanic families, which have around $17,000 to $20,000 respectively, right? So like, just look at that gap. It's literally a hundred thousand dollars difference in the family wealth that the like, average families in the United States have just because of the color of their skin. So individual payments need to be made to catch up to those white numbers. That's the first, right? And of course, this is changing. Um, and Ben Shapiro would say, like, oh, we see a lot of black successful people, and they're proof that the playing field is not that unfair anymore. But those are anomalies, like Black individuals who manage to succeed despite adversity, they are the exception more than the rule. And we should not be complacent just because a few individuals manage to dig themselves out because it shouldn't be that hard in the first place. But it is hard for a lot of people. It is hard for a lot of Black individuals. So we should make it so that their life setting, if this were a video game, you know, is set a little bit less in difficulty because it's really unfair the amount of struggle they have to go through just to live their life and not die on a day-to-day basis on the hands of the police and etc. So the second thing that the Black community is asking for is college tuition for two-year or four-year colleges and universities for descendants of enslaved Black Americans. So a lot of the advantages of the white community is because Black individuals were not allowed to go to school for a lot of their lives or like post-Civil War during their enslavement, um, even until like the 90s, right? Um, a lot of people were still being rejected by these big uh, universities that were the go-to universities in America. So they're asking that, you know, the least you can do is give the descendants free tuition so that they can experience something that their ancestors were never able to. And for me, I think that's fair. Like, do you think that's a little bit too much? Because some people, like after the first point, like two to five, since I did mention there are five things that the Black community is asking for, like a lot of them are, you know, controversial controversial already. Like, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, I think like that that makes sense, Naman, right? Um, Because the, the main basis for that is the ancestors were deprived of education um, and that caused some damages. We need to repair that by giving that education. So in a sense, it's like we can't really estimate how much was lost or um, how, how much in terms of money was not given or was not acquired as a result of not getting education. So in order to remedy that, let's just give education. So I think that's like, um, I think what will be common in these next four points is that we can't really estimate the Hmm. financial cost of slavery on these families. So let's just approximate it by doing certain things. And I feel like education is a really great way to start. And like, I don't think it should be that controversial because we are basically saying like, let's just give education to people. Um, I suppose that it will be controversial because people would say that, oh, the only reason why you're in this university is because you're Black and not because of your own merit. But I don't think that that's necessarily true because even in these affirmative action situations, you can't just claim, I'm Black, let me into Harvard, right? You, You also need to be competitive even as a Black person. Like It's still a competitive system even if you're from a minority group, right? Yeah, yeah. So actually, that that brings me perfectly to the third point, because the third point is also still about education. It's about student loan forgiveness. And they say that if you were a descendant of an enslaved Black American, your student loan should be forgiven because it's not enough that you're able to go to school. You should be able to go to school for free because the strain on your family to get you through college is a lot more than the strain it is for a like white individual. So this is where I kind of understand the controversy. There's a controversy here about we're already giving you money. Why are we also giving you extra money in the form of student loan forgiveness? So what are your thoughts on that one? Student loan forgiveness, I feel it's it's a bit more removed from the idea that, you know, um, because earlier the logic was that 
your ancestors were deprived of education. Let me, you know, subsidize your education this time. Um, I feel like that is sort of an extension of that. Like, let's say that you can already go to school. Let me pay for the expenses there, especially if you loan. Um, so it's not really targeting all Black people. It's targeting those pe- Black people who are more vulnerable compared to others. And their vulnerability is evidenced by the fact that they have student loans. Because the bigger your loan is, it means that you have less capability to pay. Mm-hmm. right? So it's more targeted in the sense that we're looking for poorer Black families and those who will, those are the people who will prioritize in giving reparations to. Although my personal take is we should just like forgive all student loan debt. Yeah, <laughs> same, same. Um, actually, what's interesting is the third point is actually already being done by some universities. Like you'd be surprised. Like a lot of them are actually like giving free tuition to um, descendants of enslaved Black Americans. So universities including Georgetown and Princeton Theological um, Seminary, which is, you know, it's Princeton's theological branch. It's the second oldest seminary in the country. They're aiming to atone for the fact that they used slaves to build up their universities and allowed them to be the elite institutions that they are today, right? So descendants of the slaves sold by Georgetown and Princeton Theological Seminary are now entitled to full rights and benefits bestowed by those universities to, ob- to obtain like degrees in whatever course they want. So it's amazing, like... That's, that's a step in the right direction. Like some people would argue it's tokenistic, but I think like individual lives are actually being benefited from it and we should take what we can. Sure, it's tokenistic. We can do more, but we shouldn't, you know, like turn this down because it's already a good bargain to some degree. Like we can ask for more, but we should not turn this away just because it's not exactly what they want, right? And the Virginia yeah. state legislator is actually are voting to apply this to their entire state. So that's also something we can look forward to. I don't know the progress there. Um, The website hasn't been updated in a while, but I do think that the fact that it's being discussed by the legislator is already a good thing. Yeah, I was was actually going to mention, since you were talking about universities, I wanted to mention the University of Tuskegee because... Um, since the, the theme for this month's Black History, for this year's Black History Month is Black Health and Black Wellness, it's very important for us to remember the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. So the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment um, started in 1932. Um, and what happened there was um, the U.S. Public Health Service and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, they wanted to study the effects of untreated syphilis. So the U.S. government and the University of Tuskegee, what they did was they got around 600 poor Black people, 400 of which had syphilis. Um, To get them to sign up, they were told that they would get free medical care, which they actually did get for almost everything except for syphilis. So if they're feeling syphilis symptoms, they were like, nah, that's just your bad blood. Um, And also, if they're feeling symptoms, they weren't given treatment for it. They were given placebos or ineffective methods and stuff like that. In fact, for many of them, they died and they never knew or they were never informed of their diagnosis that they had syphilis. So it continued for 40 years and it would have continued for even more years if it weren't for a leak to the press in 1972. And as a result of that, 28 people died directly from syphilis. 100 people died from related complications. 40% of their spouses were infected. 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. So if there's any university that should give like compensation, I think it should be like the University of Tuskegee. And I just looked it up. Apparently, they're not doing much of like forgiving student loan debt, um, but they did create a Tuskegee Legacy Committee in 1996 um, that was basically trying to persuade President Bill Clinton to apologize on behalf of the government and to, uh, to develop a strategy to address the damages of the study to um, you know the morale, the, the psyche of African-Americans. Um, about this government-led research. 
so I am actually looking at Tuskegee.edu. Um, there is nothing here about forgiving student loan debt. There's nothing here about reparations. Mostly what they're doing is they're asking other people um, in the government to fix the, the situation. I suppose like this entire page where they're just talking about the study is a form of symbolic reparation um, in terms of recognition for a past wrong. But it seems like they're actively like passing the, the buck to other actors like the public health service or just the federal government, stuff like that. Yeah, like I think like given that it's also Health and Wellness Month, I mean, that's the focus for this Black History Month. I think we should also look at how they're being treated generally by the healthcare system. So it's not just about syphilis. A lot of like, for example, like as a as a woman, like I've read a lot about how ob are like very white centric, right? Like the fact that there was a trending post on Twitter a few weeks back about the first photo of anatomy that uses like the black a black individual or a black woman that was like revolutionary and it just occurred to me like yeah i've never see- seen like in bi- biology books black anatomy it's always white individuals like why is that why are we so afraid of talking about the human body and the differences that might exist and the treatments that might be different for like black individuals and white individuals and how they might be at a disadvantage because of the color of their skin. So those are things that need to be discussed, not just in the past, but even now, like a lot of our healthcare is very, uh, it's not just about being American. It's, it's just about being white and pale. Like even the Philippines, right? There's a preferential treatment for if you're fairer skinned, especially if you go to the doctor, like they will, like when I went to a um what what do you call the skin doctor? <laughs> Sorry. I'm dermatologist. Blanking. Yeah, when I went to a dermatologist, right? Like she's one of the best in their field. Like uh I went to one of the more known ones. Um, because I, I I was breaking out because of hormones and stuff, stuff like that. And I was asked, like, do you want skin whitening? And I was like, What? And like they were like, Yeah, we'll give you skin whitening because you're you're pretty morena. And I was like, Oh my god. Why do you hate my skin so much? <laughs> you're, you're not even like... Yeah, I'm not even that morena, right? But they were like, you could be whiter. Why don't you want to be whiter? And I was like, oh my God. I never returned. I got like my first dose of treatments. Like, and like I had to take oral medicine and like some toner on my face. But I never continued because I was so scared that what if they just without my consent, gave me toner that was meant to whiten my skin without, you know, me knowing. Or yeah, the pills so even. Like, I, yeah. I actually do know some people. We have some mutual friends that are just like boycotting skin whitening products as well as um, skincare products that have microplastics in them because it's bad for um, yeah. marine life. Hmm. But there's, there's a lot of unethical practices, no? Or at least like damaging practices in the you know, the skincare or the beauty industry in general. Yeah, we can make an entire episode about that because I have a lot of thoughts as like a woman who has to live through that. But like, imagine if you're a black individual having to go through that kind of microaggression on the daily, like being told that you'd be prettier if you were white, being told that I'm going to treat you differently because there is a uh, different... Uh, I'm going to treat you differently just because of the color of your skin. Like those things are brutal to hear on a daily basis. And like, I feel like there should be a form of reparation for that as well. Like I didn't find any, but if we were like debating this Kyle and we were to conjure something up, what would that kind of reparation be? Um, I don't know, probably like, um, hmm, like affirmative action sa mga models. No, no, not just that. Like in the medical field, like being treated differently. Oh, of the color of the I thought I not thought, beauty uh, industry, not beauty industry. Beauty industry. Like we did have a motion in a previous tournament. It was a uh, debatable intervarsity, I think, um, with Dr. RJ when we were talking about um, in the academe, let's subsidize or let's give research grants to more people of color. So maybe you can have like a quota there. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good way to do it. But like number four in the actual list that I found of ways that the Black community would like to be uh, given compensation, I guess, or like 
the form of reparations they would like to see. One of them is about housing, now, down payment grants and housing revitalization grants for descendants of enslaved Black Americans. So you said this already earlier, right? That they had to be forced out of different communities, like they had to form ghettos. Um, so down payment grants will provide Black Americans with some initial equity, I guess, in their homes relative to mortgage um, insurance loans. And we, I could, I guess, like what would happen here is they're not asking to be moved, right, to better communities, or they're not asking white communities to adjust. They're just asking that you help us develop our own communities into, you know, something at par with the white communities and the white neighborhoods that, like, a lot of people prefer, right? So I think this is fair as well. Again, a lot of people find this controversial because they're just like, why don't you just move out? But I guess, you know, that's besides the point. The, the, the problem isn't that they can't move out. It's that they shouldn't need to move out anyway. Yeah, I think um, I think the link there is quite clear. No? That there is a history of racial segregation in terms of housing. So we need to be able to repair that. And that might be in the form of mortgages, especially since like there is no such thing as like a depreciating land value, right? So the thing about land is the price of it always increases. Um, And that's the reason why a lot of people think it's a solid investment. Um, So it would really make sense if you help um, Black individuals or Black families deal with their mortgages as well. So I'm really G for that. <laughs> I'm, <Yeah>. not, <laughs> I'm not the person who will benefit from it. I'm not the one who's going to set the wheels in motion, but it makes sense to me. Like, um, Whenever I think about these kinds of motions, I feel like there always needs to be a link between the solution that you want to give and the harm that you want to address. Hmm. So I can sort of understand why people would like feel weirded out by um, the forgiveness of student loans as as a form of reparations, I, I can probably see why some less informed people would take exception to that because we all have student loans. Why don't we all get forgiven? The first response that I have there is like, yeah, yeah. you're right. You're we right. should all have student loans forgiven. But also, you need to take into consideration the context. Like, they're probably able to go there um, in spite of their, I know, of their family suffering through through slavery. But still, they would have had an easier time if they didn't go through these things. So in order to remedy that, we need to be able to subsidize their student loan debt. Um, although I still feel like you can actually argue this, I think reasonably um, say that you're removing the focus away from how predatory educational institutions are in general. Because like student loans are hugely inflated, delega, and like this happens with or without slavery. Um, because I would think that even white people are victimized by um, just how much student loans there are, and it's not their fault. Um, it's actually the fault of for-profit educational institutions. And in fact, there's the, there's like recent news about how a lot of these big Ivy, Ivy League schools are sort of colluding um, and doing price fixing, which is a very anti-competitive sort of thing by looking into um, the capabilities of people to pay. So they are doing like really messed up stuff. And that is, I think, a reason why you shouldn't let forgive um, these educational institutions just by making them subsidize student loans of Black people. I think like the whole system needs to be um, reassessed. So I think that you can oppose it on that ground. Like it's too narrow of a thing to do. Yeah, but for me, like you can do that first while we're aiming to abolish, right? Like it doesn't take away, like you can have both at the same time, I, I feel. Like you can forgive their student loans, like start with them. And then once everyone's like, hey, this worked out, we should cancel everyone's student loans. Like that's a, like, I think if anything, it's symbolic if they're the first ones to be given this kind of forgiveness um, in yeah. terms of student loans, right? Um, That's fair. But, Although yeah. I think that the debate then would be, um, is that even true? Timeline. 
Yeah. Yeah, as I went through, like, how much political capital are you losing by focusing on them instead of reassessing the whole system? Yeah, but if you want to use the characterization of petty Americans, right? Like, hey, the Black community has this. I want this for myself, too. They, they might, you know, might actually do the right thing and lean left just because the Black community got something out of it. <laughs> but, you know, that's <laughs> like, like they're going to, you give a benefit to the Black community. Uh, the white community gets so jealous. They do it for themselves. Problem solved for everyone. Happy, happy. Like, happy, happy. I, I feel like that's the best way to go about it. But that's just me and my disillusioned thoughts on, you know, the American political system because they are going in flames. I mean, similar to the Philippines, I'm not speaking from a place of ascendancy. I'm speaking from a place of empathy. <laughs> but the fifth one, um, actually for me, this is, I see the link, but I saw a lot of people in the comment section of this page like going against this one. It's business grants for Black communities, um, like for them to start their own businesses, to obtain capital, especially since banks don't usually lend them capital. Like a lot of people would say, like Ben Shapiro would probably say like, oh, that's because of your like credit score or whatever. But again, right, I see the connection. Like because you were from a poor household, because you are a descendant of slaves, you weren't able to build that good capital to obtain the ability to start your own business. But some people think it's overkill. Like, why do they need to start businesses in the first place? So for me, I guess, as a millennial, I see the essentiality of like start being able to obtain capital for a business, being able to set up your own um your own thing, not being enslaved to another corporation. Like, I feel like that's symbolic empowerment, right? Especially for a Black individual. But I can also see why others would think it's overkill. Yeah, I understand that. Maybe it's not overkill so much as, like my comment from the, the previous point, it might be something that's too narrow when we should be looking at some some greater thing. Like, I think that it should be easy for people to set up businesses, right? Like, there shouldn't be like much barriers to entry for any for any person right so i think you can relate that to motions about uh for example the democrat party should they focus more on economic issues rather than um identity politics whatever that means because like you can see that a lot of these issues based on racial lines they have an effect on their economic standing as well. And they're not alone in that ne- in that um, disadvantageous economic position. So the argument there is like, if you focus on a general thing more, we have more support to make that reform. And as a result of that, the Black um, community will also be um, benefited. But we have to like be nuanced here as well. Like, and mm. it would depend on what the motion is about or what the topic is about because there are some experiences that are unique to people of color as well. So um, Mickey Kendall, which, uh, which I mentioned before um, in their book, Hood Feminism, they were talking about how like historically in the feminist movement, Black people were being excluded from the narrative because of that argument that if the entire feminist movement wins... Black women also win. But as a result, there are some parts of the experience of Black women that is just forgotten. So I I think that those kinds of things might be debatable. Not in the sense that we shouldn't have it at all, but in the sense that should we prioritize these people or should we look at a more general sort of forgiveness of student loans or a more general um, assistance to smaller businesses? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But basically, those are the five requests of the Black community. Of course, there are more. There are more specific ones. But these are the ones that from different like fields of study of Black communities, these seem to be the five that a lot of them coincide with. Um, of course, if you find out more and you want to advocate for more, that's completely up to you, right? But again, we're not in the position to say what they should be asking for or clamoring for. I'm just a mere vessel of like part, like I'm a medium right now and communicating through my particular channel what the Black community is advocating for and what they want. But I think that if you can, 
especially if you're on Spotify right now, like search for different Black content creators that might be making content on Black History Month as well. I think you'd find a lot of insight, a lot of their personal stories, and you can get a lot more information from firsthand knowledge of the struggles that they're going through as well as what they want for themselves. So yeah, that that was like our discussion on reparations. Again, how to make arguments on reparations takes three steps. Talking about the historical wrong, that's step one. Talking about the ongoing harm, that's step two. And talking about the reparative actions, that's step three. Of course, this can apply to other groups like feminist movements or the LGBT movement or people who have been colonized before or people who were victims of imperialism. Again, though, we wanted to make the example specifically nuanced to the Black community given the symbolism of this month and given that you know, with what's happening right now in the United States, um, they do deserve the spotlight for these particular issues. Yeah, I think mm, whenever you're talking about historical reparations, right, you always need to take a look at um, the context in which you're arguing because historical reparations are essentially all about the interests of those people. So I feel like, especially for these motions, you shouldn't think of debating as just like something that you do or something that you want to win in because it's really a big disservice to people who are actually affected by these issues. So you need to be extra empathetic in these situations. Um, So I suppose that whenever you're talking about historical reparations, um, you want to make sure that you're being authentic. And, And like you can't, there's a limit to how authentic that you can be Right, like I'm not asking you to like change your race or something. Like I identify as this race because that's pretty offensive most of the time. I mean, that's that. Some people would say that's debatable, but I think it's straight up offensive. But you know, to each their own, I guess. Yeah, but like, um, you want to empathize, but at the same time, you're not speaking over them. So if you are outside of the debate room and you're seeing these kinds of conversations happen, try to give it to the people of color. Because actually, I w- Nina knows this, but I want to let everyone else know. There is a two-part um, series on YouTube um, about Raya the Last Dragon. And it's just four hours of different people from Southeast Asia talking about the different problematic parts of Raya the Last Dragon and what Disney gets wrong in terms of representation. So I feel like th- this is a very needed project because... Whenever we're talking about historical reparations, there's a tendency for people who are in places of privilege to talk over people of color. Um, And they have their particular opinions and they refuse to acknowledge the voices of people of color if those voices do not validate the opinions of those privileged people as well. So you can see this, and like, especially with Ryan the Last Dragon, there was a content creator, Lindsay Ellis, who compared it, narratively speaking, to Avatar and the Last Airbender. <laughs> Avatar and the Last Airbender. Where did I get that? Avatar and the Last Airbender. <laughs> um, and people lost their minds because they're like, that's so racist. Why are you comparing them just because they're Asian? Um, and a lot of um, Southeast Asian people were defending Lindsay Ellis, but no one wanted to listen to them because their voices or their opinions did not validate the our wokeness. need yeah. uh, for woke harassment. So yeah. y- you can see that there is some sort of like cancel culture there, right? Um, so be as open-minded as possible. Like you are not in a position to assert dominance over anyone else. And this also applies for like members of indigenous communities here in the Philippines. Um, so there was a lot of discourse in the past about... Um, who victimizes indigenous peoples more. So there were some people from indigenous communities who were saying that it's the government that is um, that is victimizing us. There were also some people from indigenous communities who are saying that um, terrorist organizations are the ones who are oppressing us. Um, and those people, the, the latter category, they were just being ignored, mm. right? Um, yeah. So we need to be as open-minded as possible because... Like if there are conflicting um, conflicting narratives within that community, they should be the ones to resolve that. You you're, you can't go like 
I am a privileged person. And let me break the deadlock. You're not government whip for this community, right? You're an observer and you want to platform these people as well. So I guess that's it for this episode. Um, happy Black History Month. Um, let's all try to be more educated by the time that the month is over. Yep. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.